This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. My guest today is Craig Whitlock. Craig is the author of a new book called The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. And you can tell I have been through this quite a bit with all my sticky notes, yellow highlighting throughout, notes in the margins. Uh, Just an incredible book, one of the most illuminating accounts of the last 20 years in Afghanistan that I have ever read. Uh, It's important, I think, for all Americans to read this book. It was on my reading list, which you can find at officialjackcar.com in the blog section for last month, where I highlight different books specific to Afghanistan. And it's going to be on the October reading list as well, where I highlight seven of the most important books you can read as an American this year. Craig Whitlock worked for the Washington Post as a foreign correspondent, a Pentagon reporter, and national security specialist. Uh, Incredible guy, uh, amazingly insightful and thoughtful. And if you have not read the Afghanistan papers, get this book today. Gift it to people in junior high, high school, college. Uh, We will be a better informed citizenry and country if more people read this book. Now, without further ado, Craig Whitlock. So the Afghanistan papers, I mean, you can tell I've been through this book uh, quite a bit here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I got an early copy, so thank you so much. And uh, of course, I ordered my copy right away when I heard that it was coming out. So now I have two. This one's marked up with highlighting and my notes in the margins. And of course, the you know, stickies over there. Um, but this is one of, if not the most important book written this year. Um, and I think that will be for for time to come. It's uh, so important for citizens, for people thinking about going into the military, public policy. Um, I put it on my reading list last month when I chose a bunch of different books on Afghanistan to give people a little bit of a, a foundation um, to kind of assess what's going on right now and what happened over the last 20 years. And then this month in October, uh, I'm going to have it on a book uh, list that has the the seven most important books as an American that you can read this year. So can't recommend this highly enough. I've been talking about it with everybody since uh, since it first came out. So thank you so much for writing this first off. That's why I want to start. Oh, thank you. That's an honor to hear you say all those things. I, I appreciate it. Well, it's absolutely incredible. But before I get to some specifics in here, uh, how did you get to, to this point? I'm uh, fascinated by that as as well. What led up, because you're a, a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, which is no small feat. And uh, so so what got you into, into journalism first off? And then what led up to, to this book? Well, we could talk all day about that, but I'll try and keep it short. So I just, I've always been a journalist ever since I was in high school. And actually I studied history in college, but I always worked on the campus paper and figured out I could, you know, make this a career. And uh, it's not a very lucrative career, but I always saw it as a form of public service. And so I worked at a couple of smaller newspapers in, in Alabama and North Carolina, finally came to the Washington Post back in uh, 1998. And, you know, that's all I've done my whole life is be a reporter. So that's that's what I know how to do. But on this book, I actually started covering the war on terrorism. And like a lot of reporters back in 2001, uh, I joined our foreign desk and became a foreign correspondent. And my main assignment overseas was covering Al-Qaeda and counterterrorism operations. I came back to the United States in 2010 to become one of our Pentagon beat reporters. So, of course, I covered the war a lot more from that vantage point. Uh, So this was something I I really covered off and on for 20 years, what was going on in Afghanistan. Um, Starting in 2016, I got a tip uh, that an obscure government agency called the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction had done interviews with people who were involved in the war. Uh, they kept these interviews under uh, lock and key, but I, you know, at that point, people thought the war was coming to an end, and so I was very curious what all these people who've been involved in the war said about uh, the lessons learned and mistakes that were made. Um, long story short, we found out that the Inspector General had actually interviewed more than 400 people who had been involved in the war, from generals and White House officials to Afghans and aid workers. 
And so we had to sue under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, the Inspector General, to release these documents, who were about 2,000 pages of notes and transcripts. And that was the basis for a series we published a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a big response to that. So we decided to expand it. We obtained thousands of other pages of documents and oral histories from the war. And that's the basis for this book. No, it's absolutely incredible. And the story of how this came to be is almost a book in and of itself. I mean, it's uh, once again, it's it's not a it's not a small deal to to sue the federal government, essentially, under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, essentially violations on their part. Um, and was uh, was this uh, the SIGAR, the special office of the special inspector general for Afghanistan reconstruction? Uh, were those interviews, were they classified or were they just interviews that were they just didn't want to release? Yeah, the latter. They weren't classified. Actually, they, the government tried to classify parts of them after we sued, right? Because they didn't want to cough them up. But no, these these were unclassified interviews. Uh, the, the inspector general had promised people that they wouldn't release them, but the, under the law, it really didn't have that authority. You know, this was our argument in court that, you know, look, if there's senior U.S. officials talking about all the mistakes that were made in Afghanistan, the public has a a pretty strong interest in knowing what was said. They they deserve to know what these people who were in charge of the war, uh, all their admissions of failure and so forth. You know, we you know how can the public not know that? Uh, why would the government want to keep that under lock and key? So, you know, we eventually prevailed in court, uh, but no, none of this was classified. It's very different from the Pentagon Papers in that respect from the Vietnam War. The Pentagon Papers was a secret military study, but all those documents were top secret and they were leaked to the New York Times and the Washington Post, which then published them. But in this case, these documents were not classified. It's just really notes and transcripts of people riffing about all the, the screw ups in Afghanistan. And again, you know, the public has a very strong interest in knowing that it, it deserves to know it. And to me, it's almost a crime that the government kept it hidden as long as they did. Well, it's absolutely incredible. And what's fascinating is that you juxtapose what they, these senior level officials are saying in public, what they're saying under in congressional testimony, what they're saying to what senior level military leaders are saying to their troops, to the American public, and juxtaposing that with what they're saying in private in these interviews, which are in almost, in most cases, 180 out from one another. And uh, for those of us, for, for reporters, journalists that were on the ground over there observing what's going on, for those who served in uniform down there that are doing things at the tactical level, and then turning on the news and watching these senior level military officials say almost the exact opposite of what you see from turning your head and watching what's going on where you're actually standing in Afghanistan. I mean, that, that part is, is fascinating to me. And, uh, and once, where did you find out about this very obscure, um, inspector general reconstruction? Was it someone who had been interviewed, uh, told you about yeah, it or how so would you even go about finding out the about The irony this? is that this inspector general's office, their job is to investigate fraud, waste, and abuse in the war zone with, with contracts, you know, whether they're military contracts or, or aid contracts. And, you know, that's a pretty standard mission for an inspector general. This, this one had been set up by Congress, but the guy in charge of this office, a guy named John Sopko, ironically, he's a bit of a media hound. He loved huh. to give interviews and he loved to go on TV. He loved to testify before Congress. And he ordinarily didn't hold back with his criticism of how money was being wasted in Afghanistan. So I thought of all people, of all government bureaucrats, this office would be the most likely to turn over these unclassified documents. But they really fought us for this in court for three years. In fact, our lawsuit's still ongoing. There's other materials we're still trying to obtain that they won't release. And I think it really came down to, they didn't. They thought it was more important to protect their bureaucratic privileges. They thought that people wouldn't speak to them willingly again if they thought their unvarnished comments might end up in public or in the Washington Post. But you know, our argument was, well, that's not your job. That shouldn't be your consideration. The public interest in what these people said overrides any concerns you have about uh, whether people will talk to you freely in the future or not. And I mean, I you know, nowadays the war is over. I don't even know how long this inspector general w will stay in office because you know what's the point right now? But you know, for historical purposes and public policy perspectives, I think it's just really important for people to see these documents, to hear, to read it in black and white, what people were saying all along about 
I mean, the blunt admissions of failure are what really distinguish these documents from the Pentagon Papers or anything else. You just you have general after general, diplomat after diplomat saying, you know, how screwed up things were. And that to me, to this day, when I read it, I'm I'm shocked by what they said. Oh, I mean, it is it is shocking. Um, and in so many different respects. And again, I encourage everybody to go out and and read this. Um, but there, I think one of those continuing lawsuits is uh in involves a name of a senior level official that um, said something that's in the book that uh, that statistics and data were intentionally uh, morphed to portray a much more rosy picture uh, than what they would actually if you were to look at the actual raw data and someone very high up in the administration on the National Security Council. Um, and I think you're trying to find that name to then hopefully interview that person uh, and find out what they, and get their their take on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in the documents we obtained was a transcript of an interview with uh, someone who served under President Obama at the White House on the National Security Council, who very frankly admitted that they would distort or, or, or make up these statistics to make the public think we were making progress in Afghanistan, and that this was a routine practice that filtered up the chain of command up to the National Security Council so that the president himself, when he'd give a speech, he'd rattle off all these stats to show that, oh, we've built more schools or we've done this, we've done that, and it shows we're winning the war. When this this person on his staff was saying this was deliberately distorted so that we could deceive the public. So our argument was not only is that shocking enough that somebody would admit this, but the public deserves to know who said that, right? Who is the person who admitted to this and, and they should have their name attached to it so we can weigh whether this person's credible or not. And the government is still fighting us to this day on, on who that person is. And that's one of the documents actually they tried to classify after the fact. And we had to prove in court that uh, there's nothing remotely secret about it, you know, under, under classification procedures that, you know, th- this should be unclassified, should stay that way. Uh, but we're still fighting to find out who said that. We figured out of these 400 plus interviews, the Post was able to identify about 100 people, but there's still about 300 who the inspector general won't release their names, even though you know, some of these people individually have admitted to me and have come out in public and acknowledged that they had given the interview. Jeez. And there's a, there's a word you use there, progress. And as I went through the, the book, I highlighted yellow highlighter all the times that senior level officials from 2001 onward said progress, uh, whether it was to, to Congress or in speeches or to reporters or whatever it might be. There's a lot of progress uh, in here that was being made over the last 20 years. If you listen to these, uh, con- this congressional testimony and, and listen to these answers that these, these uh, senior level officials have. Um, but the other part that I found so fascinating about this and the other part that I hope people will take away is just how important it is for our nation to have a free press um, and uh, for you to be out there on the front lines. I mean, without a free press and without that First Amendment, um, we, we're in dire straits as a nation. And, uh, and this is, this once again proves how important that is, um, not just so the information can get out there, but so we can take that information and take it and going forward, use it at, turn it into wisdom for future generations. So, uh, I think that's, what's so important about this work as well, other than all the actual information that's in there. Um, but, uh, I guess what was most surprising to you as you went through this? Because you were involved in national security, counterterrorism uh, operations. You've been reporting on this for a long time. Um, what was the most surprising piece of information that you gleaned from going through all of these documents uh, over the last couple of years? Well, it was really what people said, Jack, just the frank admissions of failure and, and how blunt they were. You know, when you're covering a war as a reporter, or even if you're just a member of the public, even if things aren't going well or the news is bad, you sort of assume that there's a plan, that there's some kind of strategy that's in place. And maybe it's not going great, or maybe it's going wrong or off the rails, but you assume there's a plan, right? And when I would read these interviews with generals, particularly during the Bush administration, they kept saying there was no plan. Uh, And I was shocked by this. So there was an interview with a general named Dan McNeil, an Army four-star, who was a two-time war commander under Bush. And in his interview, the inspector general, he said, there was no campaign plan. We just had a lot of tactics. I was told to go over there and kill terrorists, and that was it. And I thought, well, he's got to be exaggerating, right? Or he's talking for effect. 
Then there was another interview with a British general, another who was in charge of US and coalition troops in Afghanistan under Bush, a guy named David Richards. He said the same thing. He says, we didn't have a strategy. We had a lot of tactics, but we didn't have a proper strategy. And I was shocked by this. I mean, what general in charge of a war admits that you didn't have a strategy? And again, I'm not talking about a bad strategy or a mistaken one, but just no strategy. They were on autopilot. And that was certainly the case during the, the early years from 2001 to 2006. But I was just shocked to hear that kind of thing. There was another general, a three-star army general named Doug Lute, who was the war czar in the White House under Bush and Obama. And he said, it was much worse than you think. You know, all these this talk of mistakes in Afghanistan. He said, we had a fundamental ignorance of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. And there were diplomats who said the same thing. There was uh, an ambassador named Richard Boucher, who was in charge of South Asia policy under Bush, who said, same thing, we didn't know what we were doing. And when you hear the people in charge of the war admit, we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't have a plan, we didn't have a strategy, I mean, as a reporter, I never expected to see that in black and white. That, and we got audio tapes of some of them saying it too. And it was just, to this day, it, I'm, I'm just baffled that we could have been that clueless. And, and it doesn't change over time. It's, uh, you get some of the similar, similar comments in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2012, 2014. People keep saying this same thing over and over again about a lack of strategy or uh, about this uh, the, the war on opium that we opened up that I, I want to ask you about. But um, uh, early on, we have President Bush saying that uh, we're not going to repeat the mistakes of the Soviets. And uh, you know that's wonderful to say that right out of the gate, um, but they took it seems the wrong lessons from from the Soviets. It, we took the wrong lessons from then the first Gulf War. We took some of the wrong lessons from Vietnam. And it, it the one thing that's so shocking to me is that we have so many people that uh, are are supposed to be some of the best and brightest up there at these senior levels making these strategic level decisions. That if you were to take those strategic decisions and then apply them to us at the tactical level on the battlefield. If we'd made those mistakes, we'd have been court-martialed, sent home, thrown in jail. We would have been held accountable. And what we have time and time again from 2001 onward is this lack of accountability. Uh, we had accountability with General Marshall in World War II, obviously with President Lincoln during the Civil War. Uh, but it seems like in the 60s, these things started to change a little bit with both well, Truman and, and MacArthur in the Korean War. But then in the 60s, we have this shift where we are, uh, we don't hold our senior level leaders accountable, and they keep failing upward. And we continue to see that today with the with the withdrawal. Um, and what do, after doing all this research and covering this for so long, um, what do you think? Why do you think that is? Why do you think we we continue to not hold our senior level leaders accountable? And for our elected government officials, uh, the, the civilian. Uh, authority that controls the military, why do they not hold our generals accountable? Uh, that's a really good question. And I could talk your ear off all day about that one, because that's something not just the war in Afghanistan, but other stories I covered at the Pentagon, you'd see time and again, just this reluctance to hold uh, the brass accountable. And part of it's cultural, right? The higher up you go, the, you know, with the, the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, they tend to circle the wagons and protect general and flag officers, whenever there's any question about the performance of their duties, you know, there is, you know, as they say, different spanks or different ranks a lot of times. Um, but the irony is that in the war in Afghanistan, there was, there was one general officer who was held accountable kind of in a screwy way. This was an army four star named General David McKiernan, and he was the war commander from 2008 to 2009. So the last part of Bush's term and the start of Obama's time in the White House. And General McKiernan, unlike his predecessors or successors, was actually started to give less than rosy accounts of what was going on in Afghanistan, that the insurgency was gaining strength. There was no question the Taliban was making a comeback. Uh, the Bush administration was preoccupied with Iraq, but McKiernan said a few times in public, he said, you know, we're not winning, you know, this is going in the wrong direction. And he said, this might get better before it gets worse. Now, he wasn't slamming the war effort or saying we would lose, but he was the first guy to kind of give some honest assessments that things weren't going in the right direction. But then in May 2009, out of the blue, 
he gets fired by Defense Secretary Robert Gates. And the weird thing was when Gates was asked during a Pentagon briefing, so wait a second, why'd you fire him? He, he really couldn't give a clear reason. And it's so extraordinary for a four-star to get fired that actually McKeeran was the first war commander to lose his job uh, since Douglas MacArthur during the Korean War. So, you know, this had been, what, 60 years or something. It's just almost unheard of. And But Gates couldn't explain it. He just said, you know, we needed new thinking. We needed a new guy at the top. And specifically when he was asked, did McKiernan do anything wrong? Can you name one thing he did wrong? Gates couldn't give an answer. Now, in reporting for my book, we came across some documents, some Army oral history interviews, where some officers who were in Kabul uh, with McKiernan said that one day shortly before he got fired, he came to them and said, uh, you know, guys, the, the one thing I may have done wrong was I did too good a job of saying how bad things are over here. So he sort of, it was this premonition that he was going to get fired because of his public comments in which he admitted that things weren't going well. So whether Gates admitted this or intended it or not, the, me- the clear message he sent to the rest of the force, and particularly to, to the brass, was, you know, you, you better say the war is on the right track. You better not contradict anything I or the president say. You better give a lot of rosy talk. Otherwise, you're going to lose your job. And sure enough, for the rest of the war, uh, the generals in charge stuck to their talking points. And everybody talked about how much more progress we're making instead of giving an honest, unvarnished assessment of how things were going. Yeah, but that part was so, so telling in the book. And he didn't really even say anything too bad. He didn't say anything scandalous or uh, he just said something that wasn't quite as rosy as his predecessors had had said. And uh, he potentially became the first general to tell a bit of the truth. And uh, you hit it right on the head when you say this, uh, whether Gates, who was Secretary of Defense or Mullen, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Intended it or not, they had sent a message to the rest of the U.S. Armed Forces. They were cashiering a commanding general for telling the truth. And that was the message. Um, the unintended consequences of that um, don't just change, I, I don't think, this last, past August as we put Afghanistan in the rearview mirror. I think those, those, that is going to stay with the military for a long time, uh, especially with this track record of not holding senior level leaders accountable. Um, but then, of course, he gets replaced by General McChrystal. And when he took over operations in Afghanistan, he did a comprehensive strategy review, which all these guys do. And uh, it was interesting to me that I didn't know um, because I didn't operate at those strategic levels, but uh, that the first draft does not even mention Al-Qaeda. The reason that we went to Afghanistan in the first place uh, is not even mentioned in this first comprehensive strategy review. Uh, It it was just uh, amazing to me. And did uh, did that shock you as well? I was shocked by that because I covered that at the time. This was big news, of course. McChrystal's doing his strategic review. This is the start of the Obama administration. Everybody knew he was going to ask for more troops, and it led to this big surge in Afghanistan. And McChrystal had uh, a really good reputation as a special operator, and he'd done a good job in Iraq, and he was seen as this kind of brainy, uh, yet you know, Superman general who was going to come in and save the day in Afghanistan. So to read these documents and hear other NATO officials say that this strategy review, which I read, uh, the Washington Post published it, we got it leaked to us. Um, You know, at first it didn't even mention Al Qaeda. I was like, how can that possibly be? And I go and look at it and uh, you know, they did, they kind of inserted it after the fact. The other thing that really shocked me in there uh, was this admission by a NATO official that, McChrystal's strategy review, there was this debate over whether they could even call it a war or not, because some of our NATO allies uh, thought we were there as peacekeepers and that they had legal problems with calling it a war. Uh, So there was this big debate, apparently, unknown to the public, of whether in McChrystal's strategy review they could even call it a war. And this, to me, was even more shocking. It's like, you got to be kidding. We've been there for 10 years. All these people have died. And you, you can't even agree whether it's a war or not. So they inserted a line in his report that said, it's not a war in the conventional sense, right? And, and, and it was true. I looked it up and there it was, just as the guy described it. And to me, those two things just spoke volumes that at that point, you know, we thought our best and brightest were taking a hard look at this war and coming up with a, a clear strategy for something to, to fix it. And yet 
you read the truth, which is in behind closed doors, they, one, they can't even say if we're at a war or not. And two, they forgot about Al Qaeda, which is the whole purpose we were there. So yes, to me, those things were, were there's still a shock when I think about it. And it seems like over the, over this 20 year period, um, we don't understand the nature of the conflict in which we're engaged, particularly at those senior level leaders, which is their main job before committing America's sons and daughters to a conflict. And they just continue to fail over and over again. And even here, when, when we're talking about 2009, when we're talking about McChrystal's strategy review, it just proves that they still don't understand the nature of the conflict. Um, and here's McChrystal at the, uh, testifying to the Senate. He's saying the next 18 months will be decisive and ultimately enable success. Uh, in fact, we are going to win. We in the Afghan government are going to win. Um, and it, w what's also fascinating to me about all this is that you can take this congressional testimony from 2002, 2005, 2009, you can take the names out and mix them around. It's essentially the same things that we're being told for almost 20 years. Uh, and seeing that word progress over and over again, uh, I, okay. I mean, they, it's just, it's insane to me that you can just plug and play for 20 years and keep doing the same things. And in a couple cases, the war goes on so long that people are thinking up new ideas that were tried 15 years earlier, particularly when we're talking about, uh, the war on opium and drugs and corruption and that sort of thing. Um, was, was that a shock to you or was that, cause when I read that, I'm like, oh, well that, that makes sense because you have people that, uh, uh, you know, we're still in maybe junior high on 9-11 and now 15 years later, they're in these positions and they're coming up with these new ideas uh, to, to, to combat the, the opium epidemic or uh, corruption in Afghanistan that were tried 14, 15 years earlier. Yeah, I, I guess because I had been around so long, I was less surprised by that. Yeah. You kind of see it unfold and you scratch your head and it, it doesn't make any sense, but um, it, you're right. We were there for so long and we kept cycling people in and out, new people, that we would retry things that had already failed just because, you know, I mean, let alone the, the history of lessons learned from Vietnam or the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. We didn't even learn the lessons that from our own war in Afghanistan. Exactly. You know, and you mentioned the war on opium, but even in recent years, we, you know, we kind of went back to strategies and fighting the Taliban that that Bush used. And, you know, we had a hard time identifying the enemy and is the Taliban the enemy or are they not the enemy? And we just, it was all very vague and the, the objectives were, uh, became really fuzzy. And it was such a departure from the beginning of the war, because as you recall, back in 2001, you know, the vast majority of Americans, unlike in Iraq, they supported going to war in Afghanistan to prevent a repeat of 9-11. And everybody understood the whole purpose of the war was to go after Al Qaeda, to destroy that organization and make sure they couldn't attack the United States again. So the mission back then was pretty clear, but within six months, it kind of went off the rails. Al Qaeda uh, leaders were captured, killed, or had fled Afghanistan. Uh, but then, then our mission became fuzzy and we never really were able to articulate what exactly we were trying to accomplish or what what steps needed to be achieved before we could leave. It was always left very vague that we needed to make sure Afghanistan couldn't become a refuge for terrorists again or this or that, but it was all vague. Nobody could spell out, you need to do X, Y, and Z before the war can come to an end. And you know that really doomed us to stay there for as long as we did. And it is, it's also surprising to me that, it, that how quickly we shifted, we let this mission creep, this mission drift, uh, enter the scene. Uh, it was December 2001. That would be, when I look at it, what uh, Karl von Koschwitz in On War would say is our culminating point of victory, meaning if we continue to push past these initial successes, we're going to turn this success into defeat. We're going to snatch that defeat from the jaws of victory. And uh, that's essentially what we did in December 2001. I think we had 2,500 troops on the ground. We had about 100 special operators and uh, CIA operatives in the mountains of Tora Bora. We had some Afghan partners who are our partners because we're, we're paying them essentially. Uh, and the requests for more troops, which are not far away at the time, um, to come into Tora Bora, block off escape routes into Pakistan for bin Laden. Those requests are denied at the most senior levels because we don't want to look like we are invading this country with hundred thousand troops. Of course, we got there over time, but in the beginning when it would have been important to have flooded the country, uh, we, those requests are, are denied. 
Um, we push past that culminating point of victory. Of course, Osama bin Laden escapes, uh, really guaranteeing that we're going to stay there until we eventually capture him uh, or kill him. And uh, But that point right there, also at the same time that President Bush is requesting that Tommy Franks come to Crawford, Texas and ask him about Iraq. Can we fight two war, two front war? Um, putting that question to, to Tommy Franks. Uh, so it's so interesting that we shift focus so quickly uh, and we take the wrong lessons from the pages of history uh, when we could have uh, captured bin Laden and maybe put an end to this or certainly have a different 20 years going forward. So that shift to Iraq and not focusing the proper resources on Afghanistan out of the gate, to me, it essentially doomed us to what, uh, what we eventually had to go through as a nation for the last 20 years. Yeah, Jack, I think you're right. It's hard to overstate uh, the problems that caused by the shift in resources and attention to Iraq. Um, the best way to sum it up, there was this memo that, a confidential memo that Donald Rumsfeld wrote. Uh, I, it was about a year into the war, so October 2002. And he describes going to the White House to meet with President Bush. Uh, and he goes in the Oval Office and tells Bush that, uh, Mr. President, there's two generals in town who I think you should meet with. One is General Tommy Franks, who, as you mentioned, was the CENTCOM commander in charge of planning the war for Iraq, which was about six months down the road yet. The other general was a guy named Dan McNeil. And Bush says, oh, yeah, Tommy Franks, I want to meet with him. We've got to talk about Iraq. But who's General McNeil? And Rumsfeld says, well, sir, he's, he's the war commander in Afghanistan. And Bush says, oh, well, I don't need to meet with him. So here you have the commander in chief doesn't even remember the name of the general in charge of Afghanistan. And when his defense secretary says, sir, I think you ought to meet with him, Bush says, oh, I don't have time for that. It's not important. So that speaks volumes. All he's thinking about is Iraq. And you think, well, but still, why can't they do two at once? But as you see in interview after interview for the book in these documents, you hear diplomats and military commanders saying what an enormous effect this had in Afghanistan, that it wasn't just the resources, it was the high level time and attention that was focused on Iraq. And when things went bad in Iraq, then there was even less time for Afghanistan. So the war in Afghanistan really began to drift as early as 2002, 2003, 2004, really through the rest of Bush's term, it drifts. And this is when the Taliban comes back. You know, the Taliban had been defeated militarily and toppled from the government by December 2001. But over time, uh, because we took our eye off the ball, they slowly come back and we're sort of because we're bogged down in Iraq, we were very slow to be able to do anything about it. Oh yeah. It, and the, the, some of these other things, when we talk about the, uh, the war on drugs that shifts our focus uh, over there, and we talk about this uh, USAID, essentially a money pit, um, and people that were on the ground can see it. And now the American public can see it with all the, the weapons and vehicles and helicopters and everything that we've, we've left behind. But uh, there, there's a couple amazing uh things that you point to here in the book, this hydroelectric power plant, a hundred miles north of Kandahar, um, and the, the corruption that, that goes along with that. Um, but it, it, were you surprised by how much fraud, waste, and abuse was, uh, uh, just, and how many people got very wealthy, uh, on the contractor side of the house, both in the United States and then also overseas on the Afghan partner side of the house. There's the one story with uh, the two brothers, the, the one who destroys the bridge and then right. the other who gets money to build it again and the other one who destroys it and the other one builds it. Um, and that's just a, a natural part of uh, of doing business over there. Yeah, well, that was what's shocking or the frank admissions that people knew while this was going on that we were throwing good money after bad. And to hear people say it so directly was, you know, really make your, your eyebrows go up. Um, but I think it's important to distinguish we went about it in a weird way. Under Bush, there was this reluctance to spend money in Afghanistan at, at a time when it needed it the most, at the time when we could have stabilized the country with a little more money and forethought. We went to Iraq, and so we didn't spend very much in Afghanistan in the first few years. Then when Obama comes into office, you know, he had promised to fix the war in Afghanistan. So he goes to the opposite extreme, and we end up spending way more money in Afghanistan than it could possibly absorb, which only made the corruption far, far worse. 
you know, so yes, there is a lot of corruption in Afghanistan and certainly corruption at, at all levels of the Afghan government. So they deserve a big part of the blame. But as you see in these documents, you know, the Americans are the one who made it happen. There was one interview with a State Department advisor named Barnett Rubin, who is actually an academic expert on Afghanistan. And he said, you know, corrupt, there's one essential ingredient for corruption, and that's money. And we were the ones with all the money. So his point was, we were enabling the corruption because we kept sending so much money over there. And we knew we were spending it in, in wasteful ways, but even worse, ways that were that made the corruption worse. There was there was another encounter during the Bush administration in 2006 when the US ambassador, a guy named Ron Newman, went to meet with Hamid Karzai, the president of Afghanistan. He went to chew him out a bit about all these corrupt ministers and governors in, in under Karzai. And in particular, he was giving him a hard time about his half-brother, this guy, mm -hmm. Ahmed Wali Karzai, who was the political boss of Kandahar and was known to be corrupt and it was rumored that he was involved in the drug trade. Um, so our ambassador goes in to tell Karzai, you need to fire your brother from his job. He's too corrupt. And Karzai hit the roof and said, you, you think he's corrupt? One, do you have any evidence of this? And the ambassador couldn't, didn't have any hard evidence. And Karzai said, well, you realize where he gets all his money. It's from U.S. military contracts and from the CIA. So it's you Americans who are paying him off. And now you're telling me he's corrupt and I need to get rid of him. And, you know, what can you say to that? He was absolutely right that we, we complain that the Afghans are corrupt, but we were the ones who made them corrupt because of all the money we were shoveling over there. No, it's incredible. This the circle, the I mean, the, the self licking ice cream cone aspect of this whole thing. We're we're funneling, you know, we're we're fueling this corruption in a society that really doesn't see it as corruption. They just see it as the normal course of doing business. Was my uh, it was what I saw anyway. Um, and once again, us kind of mirror imaging ourselves and our our values on another culture. Their idea of loyalty is a little bit different from ours. Like, why wouldn't you go over to the stronger warlord side? That just makes sense. Let's go over to the winning side uh, or go to the side that's paying you more. Like the, those things are just, are this natural and normal. And then we try to change those when we go in there. Um, it's, it's one it's again, not understanding the nature of the conflict, uh, the economy, the politics, the culture, the religion, the language, all those things um, that we should have understood before or could have at least come to an understanding of over these 20 years at some point and applied a little, little wisdom to, to all of this. Um, but I want to go back quickly to the progress piece, because it's, it's amazing. Um, and, uh, just a few of these, it's making progress, achieving progress. These are just, these things come up time and time again. Um, uh, with general Petraeus in front of Congress saying important and hard fought progress. We have March, 2012, general John Allen saying the progress is real and importantly is sustainable. Uh, 2013, it is change of command ceremony. He says, this is victory. This is what winning looks like. The campaign is, and always has been about the Afghan people and about winning. Okay. Uh, and then general Mark Milley at the same ceremony saying to the Afghan troops, you will win this war and we will be there with you every step of the way. We are on the road to victory, on the road to winning, on the road to creating a stable Afghanistan. In September, 2012, uh, at a Pentagon briefing, general James Terry says, there is progress over here. Once again, progress uh, here in the campaign. We have momentum. Then Mark Milley, a year later, the conditions are set for winning the war. Uh, and Trump administration 2018 progress from General Scott Miller, who I understand is a great guy. Um, but after 17 years, he continues to use this word progress. Um, and uh, General Votel, again, July 2018, I think our efforts here in Afghanistan are showing progress. Uh, did did any of that make you angry as you were doing this research? Are you, uh, as a journalist, are you detached enough that you can take your emotions out of it and just take these things and put them in there? Or did it, did it make you angry that these senior level officials are saying the same thing over and over again and Americans are continuing to die and we're investing more money? Um, did that ever make you angry? Well, I can see why it makes many people angry. I mean, yeah, journalists are supposed to be detached, but when you hear these things time and again, and you know it's completely at odds with reality, uh, yeah, it does make you, you know, on what basis are you saying this? It's almost like they're they're playing with us. Do you know what I mean? And I do. so actually what I did on this word progress, as well as when they use the word winning or victory, is I logged all these speeches. I logged all these press conferences in a database. And um, by date, all their congressional testimonies, because 
I remember hearing this time, you know, we're making progress, we're making progress, and reporters would sort of joke about it, almost black humor, like we'd roll our eyes, oh, more progress. But I wanted to go back and see exactly how often they used that phrase. And it was, it's sort of the, the, the classic talking point, right? If you're a speech writer or you're a public affairs officer and you're writing out the remarks for these, these general officers is, well, you can always justify that there's some kind of progress, right? As long as you move this or you did that, there's some progress. So, you know, it technically isn't a lie, but it, it may fly in the face of reality of what's going on, but it's one of those words they can use that really doesn't have any meaning, but sounds good and sounds reassuring to the American people. So, you know, they, it wasn't just that they said the word progress, it was the context. So every time there was a, a suicide bombing, or let's say there was a, a, a situation where lots of US troops died in a, in a helicopter crash, or the Taliban, there was an insider attack, you know, something that was clear that was, was a real setback in the war, something real serious, they invariably say, yes, 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 but we're making progress. So this became this, this catchphrase they would use to, no matter how bad things got, they would still circle back to the idea that we're making progress, right? And that's what's infuriating. It's, it's not just that they were, it was rosy talk. They were denying that things were going badly. And they, no matter how awful things got, they would invariably say we were still making progress. And like you said, so that's why when you go back and you thumb through it, I, I hope it does make you angry because <laughs> I went back and I logged all the times they said that and I couldn't believe it almost in retrospect over 20 years, but they were clearly, they were all told that this was a safe talking point and they should use this. This, this was the official messaging. And like you said, it went on till 2019, 2020, even though when it was clear that the war, you know, we were getting out of there and the Taliban was going to take over. They're still clinging to this idea that we're making progress. No, no, it's a, it, a time and time again. And uh, it, it's General Flynn quote that you have in here also is very interesting. And he says, not one commander is going to leave Afghanistan and say, you know what? We didn't accomplish our mission. You know, they all get up there in front of the troops and say, we accomplished, our, which may be true at that tactical level. Maybe they did make a little progress here and there. Like you said, it's not an actual outright lie, but it's not the truth if you're looking at things holistically, uh, strategically, long-term. Um, and even five years into the war, when you talk about Barry McCaffrey going to Afghanistan, issuing a report that things are not going well, uh, at the same time, the U.S. ambassador is telling the State Department, we are not winning in Afghanistan, but we don't see a change anywhere, uh, either in uh, in the tone, in the verbiage, in the strategy, it seems like these these warnings um, from fairly impartial people that uh, that are looking at the situation holistically um, that aren't relying on a on a retirement or hoping to get on a board of some company attached to the defense industry in a few years down the line um, that nothing changed uh, for with these people that uh, that raised the alarm or or spoke the truth or looked at things logically and then asked the right questions. Um, Nothing changed. And that's the whole reason of Barry McCaffrey going over there was to give an honest assessment of what's going on because he wasn't directly in a chain of command. And it seems like those those warnings, that assessment just went, uh, you know, just got put in a different pile. Yeah. And that's a really good question. Why didn't they change? You know, people were advised at the top, whether it was the defense secretary or war commander, you know, it wasn't that they were clueless. You know, the, the reports were coming up the chain of command and how bad things were. So why couldn't they do anything about it? And you know, there's a few answers that one is, I don't think they had any easy answers. It wasn't like, oh, you you open door B and everything's going to be okay. But I think the, the bigger problem in terms of the dishonesty and deception was this war was different from Iraq. This was a popular war at the beginning. And the American people thought we had won this war early on. They had been told this, you know, but back in the spring of 2002, uh, Al-Qaeda was gone from Afghanistan. You know, again, its leaders have been captured, killed, or had fled like bin Laden did. Uh, the Taliban was out of power. So Americans thought they had won this war, and this had been seen as a righteous cause, as a, as a just war. So from that point on, what commander-in-chief, what general wants to admit that they're slowly losing a war on their watch, a war that was popular, that had the backing of the American people? For political reasons, no president wants to admit that. So they're going to stick to these ridiculous talking points about how they're making progress, because as soon as they admit 
yeah, it was on my watch. We had won this war. We screwed it up. You know, that would take some political courage that none of them had. And so this really goes a long way to explaining why, you know, they couldn't even be honest with themselves about how things were going is nobody wants to admit failure, particularly in a war that we thought we had already won. Yeah, I mean, it's so so disheartening. But uh, in, right here, you're right. Five years into the war, however, the U.S. military still lacked an understanding of its enemies and what motivated them to fight. And a lot of us on the ground saw that same thing. A lot of us that are students of history saw that same thing. Um, and early on, also, you talk about the uh, uh, our, our NATO allies, particularly Germany, taking on building this uh, national police force, and then it being a little bit too much for them to handle, then it going to the U.S. military, once again, being a little too much for the U.S. military to handle, and going to contractors who uh, made a lot of money, essentially failing to build an Afghan police force, because these guys in Afghanistan, as you point out in the book, you go to the village elder to settle disputes. Um, and what these guys became were essentially shakedown artists on the street. Um, and so an utter complete failure any way that you, that you look at it. Um, but people made money. Well, they make money, but I, again, it's that, and we didn't understand. We thought, oh, we can create a ginormous police force in Afghanistan, right? It was like, you know, I forget, at one point it was supposed to be 140,000 police officers, but this was a country that didn't have a police force like we do. They didn't have cops who write tickets and investigate crimes and settle disputes. They, they had no tradition of this, and we tried to introduce one on such an enormous scale. And as you point out, you hear horror story after horror story in the Afghanistan papers from police trainers and others who were in charge of trying to build them up who would say, you know, the Afghan people hated the police. They saw them not as corrupt, but they saw them as a predatory force. So let's say your house got robbed. The last thing they're going to do is call police because they'll come rob your house a second time. <laughs> so, you know, but the strategic implications of this are enormous. Not only is it a waste of money, but our strategy under Obama in particular was to build up the Afghan government to win hearts and minds so that the Afghans would side with their own government over the Taliban. And yet we're building this enormous police force that's corrupt and predatory, that's just alienating the population. And so of course, even though they don't like the Taliban necessarily, they, they saw the Taliban as more just, that they resolved disputes the old fashioned Afghan way where they'd have a meeting with the elders and somebody would issue a decision right off. And they may say, we're going to chop off your hand or, uh, you know, you're guilty. You need to give us some some sheep and women. Otherwise, we're going to kill you. So it was brutal justice. But what the Afghans liked was it was decisive and it was traditional. And this new method that the Americans were trying to introduce just never took root because it, it didn't make any sense in that society. And we made things worse, not better. And we, we haven't learned, it seems just a couple of weeks ago, um, I saw the National Security Advisor talking about the billions of dollars we have in leverage over the Taliban now, um, when really what they value is our goats and wives and, and other things that, uh, that are more tangible to them than a bank account somewhere that I still don't understand wasn't frozen 20 years ago. But that's, uh, that's, a side, <laughs> that's beside the point. Um, there's something else you talk about in here that I think passed for, for most Americans, kind of just came and went uh, because of this, all the distractions that we have today. And that is uh, the significance of December 28th, 2014, uh, the day U.S. and uh, NATO officials held a ceremony in Kabul to end combat mission in Afghanistan. Um, and you would think this would be a very big event. Um, and the president, I think, weighed in from Hawaii, um, you know, maybe via video teleconference type thing. But uh, what did that do? That uh, a ceremony that ends the combat mission doesn't seem like much changed after, uh, after that mission and in, after that ceremony in 2014. Yeah, and that was an important time, Jack, because here you had Obama. Uh, he had promised to end the war by the end of his second term. Right. So he is he's about to start running for re-election again. And at the end of 2014, he issues a statement from Hawaii saying the longest war in American history is drawing to a responsible conclusion. And then the brass has a ceremony in Kabul where they declare an end to the combat mission. So when you hear that, it's a pretty clear message, right? That the war's over, we're not involved in the fight anymore. Yes, we have a few thousand troops there, but 
They're not involved in combat. That's the official line. Now, I know this is something that really made reporters who cover the Pentagon grind their teeth because they knew troops were still involved in combat. They knew this was still going on. You know, we were still on advise and assist missions. We, you know, there was this exception carved out for counterterrorism operations, which of course is combat. The combat was continuing uh, at intense levels from the skies. You know, we were drop doing airstrikes all over the place still. So there's no question combat was still going on and the war was not drawing to a responsible conclusion. You know, I document in the book, all these people who, these US service members who were killed in combat after Obama said that. Uh, and, you know, everybody who was in Afghanistan still, they, they all received combat pay, uh, combat decorations. You know, they were involved in combat. This was a war zone. So for the president of the United States to tell the public that there, there was no more combat and the war was coming to an end. It was just flat out false and he knew it. Uh, so to me, this is one of the most egregious lies of the war. And again, this was seven years ago and the war dragged on and Obama thought he was gonna pull troops out and he couldn't because he was worried the Afghan government would collapse. So they kept more troops over there and the war didn't come to an end and it dragged on to the Trump administration and finally to Biden. So. I mean, here he, he declared an end to the longest war in American history, and it's still seven years to go. Yeah, and it just passed, I think, to most of the American public. Nothing really changed. We're still sending our sons and daughters there. We're still involved there. You see the ticker on the news every now and again. Come, up. It's just, yeah, that there's so many things in here that are disheartening, and I try to remain hopeful. Uh, and what gives me hope about this this book is that we can take it, and then now we have, we have it. It's documented. It's here. It's something that's tangible. It's not going away. It's not only electronic, so it can't be just erased. We have it. It's physical right here. And we can pass it to junior high school students, to high school students, to college students, to people at the war colleges, to uh, to re responsible citizens. Um, that's why this is is just so important. So I think that's the hope that we can take for it, even though so much in here is just disheartening and, uh, and doesn't really give you confidence in our senior level leaders, both elected, bureaucratic, and, uh, and military. Um, but uh, so... So what happens, what happens now? What happens over the next year, two years? Um, does, does China move in and take Bagram? And is it like, what, what do you see going forward, having been involved uh, in this, not just this book, but over the last 20 years of reporting on Afghanistan, on the region? Um, what, what does this mean um, from a geopolitical standpoint? Um, our failure the Taliban now essentially looking like they're stronger than they were uh, on uh, on September 10th, 2001, uh, in that they have uh, better weapons, that they control more territory, that they uh, on the the world they're standing on the world stage even uh, in Afghanistan in the region and world stage um, has been increased by our actions. Um, what do you see going forward? What do you um, I guess what 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 are you hopeful about? And then what uh, what are you shaking your head at and and, uh, and what do you see here over the next couple of years? Yeah, it's a good question and a natural one. But in doing research for my book, I've, I've kind of learned the importance of humility when it comes to making predictions about mm -hmm. Afghanistan. So I'm not going to pretend. Well, short term, short term, I guess. Uh, not, short term I mean, with not, us not leaving. I'm not going to pretend have the answers. But I think you're absolutely right. The Taliban is more powerful now than they were at the start of the war. They control the whole country. Uh, whereas in 2001, you know, they maybe controlled 80 or 85 percent. They have more resources. Uh, certainly their, their military capabilities are much better than they were 20 years ago. Not only were they able to acquire weapons throughout the insurgency, but of course, all that ammunition and small arms that we left with the Afghan army and police are now under Taliban control. So I think they're, you know, like it or not, they're going to be in charge of Afghanistan. There's no resistance anymore. And that, you know, the United States and its allies are going to have to contend with an Afghanistan that's led by the Taliban uh, for the indefinite future. Now, you know, how that works, I don't know. But, uh, you know, certainly there's some things the Taliban in the United States have common interests on. And politically, this is going to be difficult because, you know, we fought them for as long as we did. And from a human rights perspective, there's such an odious regime, particularly how they treat women and children. So on one hand, how can you even try and cooperate with the Taliban? 
On the other hand, the United States has a real interest in trying to bring some measure of stability to Afghanistan. Having a civil war there or having terrorist groups operate in Afghanistan is obviously not in our interest. So if there's any way we can work with the Taliban to stabilize the country, uh, you know, at least in some fashion, that, that would be a good thing for the United States. You know, we've already seen some signs of this. In recent years, actually, the Americans and the Taliban had indirectly worked with each other to fight the Islamic State in Afghanistan. You know, the Islamic State thinks the Taliban is too moderate, believe it or not, and so they're very hostile toward the Taliban. So the U.S. military had done you know, quite an intensive bombing campaign against Islamic State forces in eastern Afghanistan. So I think there's room, perhaps, for the Taliban the United States to work against the Islamic State or terrorist groups with a more global agenda. I think the Taliban's agenda really ends in Afghanistan. They don't have this global outlook like Al Qaeda did. So even though they're they're very odious and brutal, I don't know that the Taliban itself is a threat to the United States, to our homeland. And so, you know, if we can figure out a way to work behind the scenes with the Taliban against these more radical groups, I think that would be in both interest of ours and theirs. And I think that's already started. You may remember that last month, uh, the CIA director, William Burns, flew into Kabul, met with the Taliban leadership. Uh, and I'm sure what they were talking about is, can we work together? Can we have some channels of communication open to go after these more radical groups like Islamic State? You know, and the Taliban also needs international aid to prop up their economy. Their economy is entirely dependent on donations from other countries. You know, we paid for their, the Afghan government to function in recent years. So the Taliban knows they need that aid. I mean, yes, they're they're willing to, you know, go without it if they have to. But you know, there are some carrots there as well. Yeah. And I, what is your hope that future generations take from this last twenty years, particularly younger, uh, younger enlisted, younger uh, officers right now that have seen this play out? And now we're going to be stepping up into those more senior ranks, those uh, the E7 ranks, E8 ranks, E9 ranks on the enlisted side, uh, the the major, the lieutenant colonel ranks. Those those people in that area. What do you what do you hope that they will take from this experience and then apply forward as they step into those colonel and general officer flag ranks? Well, I, you know, again, I've got my own action going, but as a reporter, you hope people learn to tell the truth to the public and that, yes, I understand there are pressures where politically, you know, you got to stick with the talking points. But I, I think we're seeing that in the younger generation of officers and enlisted that, you know, they have a duty to tell the truth to their, the people under their commands, mm -hmm. but also to the public at large. And they have seen the consequences of not doing that in Afghanistan and in Vietnam. And I, I hope that real that impetus really takes root. And as those people climb up the ranks, they'll they'll say, look, I've I've got a duty to tell it straight. And I get it, you know, you have to operate within a realistic band here in the chain of command, but that, you know, they're gonna tell the truth and they're not gonna say, well, look, that next rank isn't worth it to me if that means I have to lie just to protect my own career. And I'm I'm hopeful for that that people learn those lessons and see that. Right now, that seems hopeful, but at the same time, we had a gener the generation of, of general officers that ran the war in Afghanistan, they thought they had learned those lessons from Vietnam. You know, one guy to bring up is uh, Lieutenant General Herbert McMaster, H.R. McMaster. I mean, he was well known as an army colonel for writing this history of the Vietnam War and how the military brass failed the country uh, by by not standing up to the civilians and giving straightforward advice. So he was a guy who wrote a whole book on learning lessons from Vietnam and what you need to do at senior levels to make sure the country doesn't get dragged into this unwinnable war and the importance of telling the truth. And yet, you know, by the time he's in charge as national security advisor under Trump, you know, it seems like he forgot a lot of those lessons and he, he let those same problems persist. So you know, it's something that there needs to be constant vigilance about. And, you know, I hope that's one reason to write this book is so there is a, a written record, historical record of it, because, you know, so many people from the younger generations today, I mean, they're familiar with the war in Afghanistan, but they've forgotten why we were there to begin with. They're, 
you know, it's 20 years, it's a lot to get your head around and have a basic understanding of what went wrong is really important to prevent us from repeating those mistakes in the future. Yeah, the study on H.R. McMaster is a, is a fascinating one, and I hope to have him on the, the podcast at some point and ask him about this in a very respectful way, of course. But when you read Dereliction of Duty that he wrote, uh, I forget how many years ago it was, but that's an incredible book about the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, uh, and, and civilian leadership and that interaction and why that led to failure in Vietnam and all of that. Um, I mean, it's an incredible book, but then you juxtapose that to his more recent memoir. Uh, that I don't know. It almost seems like two different people. Um, right. It and, is uh, two different people. I've read them both, and you, it's hard to imagine the same person wrote both books. It's it's that that part. So I'd love to ask him about about that at some point. But uh, yeah, dereliction of duty. I, yeah, it's a, I highly recommend that as as well for an overall getting understanding of civilian military relations. Um, and that part, that piece about trust when we're talking about military leadership or leadership in general. That's what I found from from my time in the SEAL teams is that building that trust both with those uh, those beneath you and above you in the chain of command. There's nothing more important than that. Uh, and if you do not tell the truth, they will know, particularly those, those, uh, the enlisted guys that you're in charge of, they will 100% know, and you will lose all credibility. Um, the telling the truth, being honest, giving your honest assessment, both up and down the chain of command. There's, there's nothing more, more important than that. Um, and interesting when we were talking about this, uh, accountability piece, um, you're probably familiar with Lieutenant Colonel Paul Yingling in that uh, article, he wrote a failure of generalship when he says, as matters stand now, a private who loses a rifle suffers far greater consequences than a general who loses a war. And that continued, that was written, he wrote that in 2007. And that we were seeing that play out today in congressional testimony. As, as we're recording this, uh, we have generals in front of Congress. And once again, if you lost a rifle as a private, big trouble. You lose a war and you see now all these rifles that we left behind. I mean, there, there's nothing that illustrates the difference between accountability at the junior level and the senior level more than that. Absolutely. And he was, England was actually, I think, more focused on the war in Iraq at that yep, point. Exactly. It's, it's even more applicable to Afghanistan. Uh, but that's one reason why they keep talking about progress, right? If you insist we're making progress, nobody can say you lost the war. But there's another character in this play, if you will, that we haven't talked about that much, but that's Congress. And they're the ones who are supposed to be exercising oversight and ensuring accountability, not only with the war itself and all the, the money that we're spending, which they authorize. But I think one issue with Congress over the years in watching people testify who are military commanders is they're overly deferential uh, to some of our leaders in uniform, particularly uh, under Obama's term, there was this, you know, understandable sense of gratitude to to military leaders uh, during a time of war, particularly when we had the most troops overseas. Um, but I think at the same time, they 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 lost their sense of skepticism and their their responsibility to ask tough questions. There was a lot of deference whenever people like General Petraeus or General McChrystal or others would go testify before Congress. They, you know. Th lawmakers would call them heroes, and, and that's all fine. But when it came time to asking those tough questions like, well, what do you mean progress? And what about this and this and this? And you know th that went missing. And in recent years, really, Congress stopped asking questions altogether in Afghanistan. They just stopped paying attention. So I'm glad they're having hearings now, but I, I hope it's not just the usual partisan finger pointing, and they don't just focus on the end of the war. Uh, but, you know, they, somebody really needs to take a look at what went wrong over 20 years, a really honest, clear eyed assessment that doesn't have all the, the political shouting involved, but just, you know, almost something like the 9-11 Commission did after the September 11th attacks, where they ended up having public testimony uh, that was pretty sober minded and pretty serious. And they wrote a book that to this day people can read to see what mistakes were made that enabled 9-11 to happen. You know, I, I hope we can get something like that for Afghanistan. Yeah, I hope so too. Actually, I called for that a few weeks ago um, on my, my social media account. I took that 9-11 commission report, uh, that, that, that initial impetus behind it, and I shifted it around a little bit. And then I, then I posted it uh, saying that exact same thing, that, uh, that we need uh, an accounting of what happened over the last 20 years so we can learn those lessons forward uh, from it, kind of like we did with the 9-11 with the commission report. Um, 
something else that's interesting, and I, I know we're, we're going a little bit over time here, but uh, the day before September 11th, 2001, I think Rumsfeld gave a speech about Pentagon transformation and things were going, it seemed in the right direction on that day. You had someone new coming in um, who, of course, the, the bureaucrats can outlast. And uh, you, you, you've seen, you see this in government time and time again with new administrations come in and how you look at your watch and say, okay, we just have to wait four years. So the next guy, or in the case of uh, a secretary of defense, maybe 10 months, maybe 12 months, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, but there's going to be a new guy in here that's going to take another six months to get up to speed. That's going to have his own agenda. And we're just going to wait him out with our pet projects or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. But this whole, this whole system is just so, uh, I don't know, incestuous. And there's, there's so much, uh, there's so many reasons not to transform, um, and not to move the ball forward, not to take the lessons of the past and apply them to the future. Um, but in that speech, he did talk about transformation, but then the next day, everything changed and we go to war with, uh, with the military that was essentially built for, for something different. Um, it seems like if we need to now 20 years later, go back to that with a, uh, secretary of defense and an administration that wants to focus on future emerging threats, preparation, uh, applying the lessons of the past, not just for the last 20 years, but of the Soviet experience of, of Vietnam, of the, the three British uh, experiences in Afghanistan in the, uh, the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, hopefully we can get what Rumsfeld was talking about on September 10th, 2001, at least look at the Pentagon and look at the military through that lens of transformation for future possible emerging threats. Um, what, what do you think the, uh, uh, the likelihood of that is? It's hard. Um, it's really hard. Having come covered the Pentagon for a number of years, that bureaucracy is really entrenched, and it's hard for even a powerful person at the top to change direction. Um, you know, Rumsfeld was a very forceful personality and, uh, you know, he struggled to get that done, but, you know, he, he was, he was hell bent on trying to do it. You know, I, I remember his successor, Bob Gates, when he was defense secretary, he talked a lot of times about, he came in and he said, it felt like the building forgot we were at war in Iraq and Afghanistan, that they had so many, uh, weapons buyers and, people who were invested in these legacy systems that, uh, you know, they were still focused on a pre 9-11 mindset. And this was 2006 by the time Gates came in. So, I mean, he, he had a hard enough time getting MRAPs and drones and things like this, that he had to crack heads to get the services to change their approach to stop this, this old 20th century mindset and get acclimated to the wars they were in then. Um, so it's very hard to change to future threats. And that's that's another thing Gates said that was, I thought he was right about. He's, he said, we're always fighting the last war. You know, we're refighting the last battles. And we're not very good at predicting where threats will come from in the future. In fact, we almost always get it wrong when we're trying to predict where the next war is going to come from. But even just having that recognition that you know, we can't be certain and you need to be flexible and we can't be wedded to the past. You know, even that mindset would be uh, a breath of fresh air at the Pentagon. I think they just get so wrapped in to these ruts of the old way of thinking that to perpetuate these legacy systems and operations and the way the bureaucracy works, it's very difficult to change that. You really need a new president to come in who appoints a, a new secretary of defense with very clear marching orders uh, to make very fundamental changes along those lines. And I'm not prescribing anything specific. I'm just talking about a different direction. And then you almost need that defense secretary to stay for several years, you know, for the president to be reelected. You know, we haven't had defense secretaries stay in office very long for the last decade. I mean, Gates and Rumsfeld were pretty strong personalities, but you know, after Gates left in 2011, we, we kind of go through a defense secretary every 18 months or 24 months. And, that, you know, it's impossible for somebody to really change anything if they're only in office for that short period of time. 
Yeah, no, it's exactly it's exactly it. And and my worry is we're not going to take that lesson and, and apply it going forward. And the next conflict, we're going to really learn these same lessons in blood. Um, but it seems like also we if we, we think that if we throw enough money and resources at a problem, we can fix it. And what what you outline here in the book is how that wasn't the case, and not just was it not the case, but it made the situation worse in many circumstances. Um, and I, I wrote this. I want to get your uh, reaction to it. I wrote this. Uh, Obviously, having lost friends over there, uh, seeing the withdrawal and and uh, just seeing how that how that played out was uh, was, was difficult for 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 many people. Um, and I wrote this. I said, as Doctor David Kilcullen notes, the enemy was prepared with a strategy they've used against invading army armies for centuries: provoke, intimidate, protract, exhaust. Our enemies have figured out how to not only effectively counter but defeat the most technologically advanced military on Earth. In what was accurately described as imperial hubris. The United States political military establishment confused initial entry and resolve with victory. They were wrong. America's sons and daughters paid the price. Our elected officials and senior level military leaders were trapped by their own intellectual inertia, condemning us to eventual defeat. Um, so I my, my question is, uh, following December 20, 2001, um, what could have been done differently to change this eventual outcome that we saw last month in, in August in Afghanistan. Yeah, and so I, Jack, I think you hit the nail on the head with what you wrote. And uh, that mistake we made where we, we thought we had defeated the Taliban early on, we confused uh, this, this military victory or you know, defeating them on the battlefield with an ultimate victory. And that's something that's clear in hindsight that we, we equated the Taliban with Al Qaeda so we wouldn't negotiate with them. And we, we thought we could vanquish the Taliban, that we didn't see a need to bring them into the political system at that point when they were weak and defeated for the moment. And there were opportunities to uh, bring the Taliban into the fold when we were trying to set up a new government, a new political system in Afghanistan. We didn't have to leave them in power, but we needed to find a place for them to go. They were too much of a part of Afghan society. They had some support among Afghans, even though they were seen as this you know, brutal bunch of, of Stone Age uh, ideologues, but, you know, still they had support, particularly in the rural areas of Afghanistan, from people who didn't like the warlords and the Northern Alliance or some other corrupt people had left at, who had led Afghanistan over the years. So we, you know, that was the Afghan way of war, that after one side's defeated, you, you try and find a way to bring them back into the fold somehow to prevent instability down the line. And we, we missed that opportunity early on in December 2001. But we, we missed it again later in 2004 when there were presidential elections in Afghanistan for the first time. And those elections were seen as free and fair. The Taliban had tried hard to disrupt them to prevent democracy from taking root. And, you know, they failed, the Taliban did at that point. You know, the, the election went off pretty much without a hitch. Karzai was seen as a, as a credible uh, elected leader. And that was a time when we could have encouraged Karzai or our own leaders to reach out to the Taliban and say, okay, time to give it up, guys. You know, enough with this insurgency. Let's find a way to bring them back into the fold as a diminished force. But, you know, we thought we had defeated them, this illusion that we had, we had permanently won. Uh, and, and so that was another missed opportunity. And Again, during those early years when the Taliban was weak, we could have co-opted them, give them a reason to stop fighting, but we never did. And so the, the conflict just persisted. Uh, yeah, they're exactly, exactly right. And that's why it's so important that uh, that everybody read this, read this book, the Afghanistan Papers. Um, I mean, just, in, just incredible. It's a book that I'm going to keep championing and I'm going to keep talking about, uh, bringing up, gifting to people. Um, it, it's that important uh, and it's going to be around for, for a long time. And I think gain more steam as we as we go forward here, particularly in in war colleges, as this generation of new senior level officers takes that next step uh, into the, the the major ranks and lieutenant colonel ranks um, right here, the Afghanistan Papers. Thank you so much for, for writing this. Uh, and I do want to ask you also, what advice do you give to, like we talked about senior level military leaders or, or junior level officers and, and enlisted. Um, when you're talking to new journalists, or you go and speak to, uh, to a, a journalism school or wherever it might be, or someone new comes to the Washington Post, um, and they ask you for advice, 
what do you uh, what do you like to pass on to those new journalists that are just stepping into this world, especially when they're dealing with with social media and you're dealing with uh, all these different distractions that are out there, um, a, a news media that uh, that is weaponized by certain factions here and there. It seems what do you, what do you what advice do you pass along to to new journalists that are that are stepping into the fold? Well, we, we could talk all day about that too, but. Um, I think one thing to do is trust your instincts as a reporter. If something doesn't seem right to you, even though you may think, you know, you're covering the military, let's say you haven't even served in uniform, you don't know how things work, but something doesn't sound right, you know, trust your instincts that you need to check it out. You know, don't take people's word for it. It doesn't mean you have to be rude or confrontational. It just means, you know, check it out. You need to verify the truth of things. Don't take people's words for it. There's an old saying in journalism, uh, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> I've never heard that. That's fantastic. You don't even believe your mom. Don't take her <laughs> word for it. You need to verify it. I mean, it, it's meant to be funny, but it's a good rule to have that even if the generals are telling you something that so, uh, you know, you don't have to be rude about it, but you just, you, you need to prove that it's true. And th- that's the crux of what reporters are supposed to do. That's our job. And if you kind of keep it simple and keep your eyes on the basics, you know, you you can't go wrong. I think the other thing that personally, I think the public really craves now is um, journalism that shows its case. It it isn't partisan that, you know, this book, again, is all based on documents. It isn't me going on some harangue or screed or, or something about it. It's just, it's all based on documents. And I think when people see that, when readers see that, they appreciate it and they they say, okay, that's grounded in facts. You know, he backs it up. He doesn't have an ax to grind. This is just what he found. And I, I think that goes a long way. And again, it sounds like a simple lesson, but I think journalists in general, we need to go back to that and not just spout off on everything on social media. But, you know, we, our job is to report, is to uncover facts and tell the truth. And if we stick to that. I think we get a lot of support from the public. Oh yeah, it's a it's it's, it's an important pillar of, uh, of American constitutional Republic. Um, and, uh, and I thank you for being, doing such an incredible job with this book and with your reporting at the Washington post, uh, being such an inspiration for, for journalists out there and an advocate for, for truth and, and honesty. And it's interesting that you said that about when something doesn't look right. It's an old, uh, Vietnam era, uh, special forces sniper told me that years ago. He said, if something doesn't look right, something doesn't sound right. It's probably not trust those instincts. Um, very, very similar to what you just said. And, uh, and what's next for you? I mean, after complete, you know, completing this, and obviously it's a story that's not quite done yet. We're watching it, it play out. We're watching the, the effects of all of this last 20 years play out on the world stage. Um, what's, uh, what's next for you? Are you, uh, shifting gears into, into something else? Well, I, I've got another book I'm working on, uh, about the U S Navy and a guy named fat Leonard. I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard of him. Oh yeah. Um, what a story. Fat Leonard was a, a crooked Malaysian defense contractor who put off one of the the all-time scams in world history. And I, I've been reporting on that case for a long time for the Post, but I'm working on a book on it to tell the full story of Fat Leonard and how he he bribed so many people in the U.S. Navy out in the Western Pacific. That is an incredible story. I was in the military when that was kind of transpiring and beginning to see the light of day. And uh, you, know, you see public affairs officers making statements here and there to different questions. And it was so unbelievable. Um, but uh, But also at the same time, not entirely shocking. Um, so if both those can go together somehow, I guess that's, uh, that's kind of the fat Leonard case from my perspective anyway, from what little I, I know about it, but, uh, I'll be looking forward to that book and hopefully you'll come back on. We can talk about all that because, oh my gosh, that, uh, I mean, that took down a, a lot of people. Um, and yeah, just that it's, 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 it's incredible. another one where it's worse than you think. Oh boy. But, well, I'm <laughs> for the book to come out. Cause it's, it's a, it's an eye opener and it, it's entertaining, but it's shocking. And it's one of those things you can't believe it really happened, but it's taken a while to get to the bottom of it. Oh, amazing. I, know, I assume that there are probably a few, uh, I don't know if there are Freedom of Information Act requests that went along with, with some of that, uh, that opened a few doors and uh, went- Locked. Yeah, okay, good. Good. I'm excited for uh, for that. So hopefully we can talk about that here in the future. But uh, yeah, once again, thank you so much for writing this book. It is so important. Uh, everyone needs to read it. And uh, I'll be gifting it to a lot of people over the next over the coming months and years. So uh, thank you for all you do, and and thank you so much for taking the time today to to come on and and uh, talk about this. Well, Jackie, it was an honor and privilege being on your show. Really enjoyed talking with you, and thanks for having me on. 
Welcome to the gear highlight section of the Danger Close podcast, brought to you by Schnee's Boots. Now, I've been using Schnee's Boots for a little over a decade, I think. And uh, as you can tell, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's some miles on these. I've used them in Alaska, in Utah, in Colorado, and uh, I absolutely, Montana, absolutely love these boots. If you followed me for a while, you've heard me talk about them before, seen uh, me wearing them in some pictures. And uh, these guys right here, these are the granites. And these are the first ones that I got. And they fitted me at uh, either Safari Club International or Dallas Safari Club and just fell in love with these boots. There's no middleman with these guys. So they are made in a factory in Italy. And that allows uh, you to get a lot more for your boot, a lot more for your money, a lot more boot for your money. That's what I'm going for right there uh, because there's nobody else in that supply chain. Italy to Schnee's in Montana to you. And you can always call them anytime. Hey, I'm going on this kind of a hunt. What kind of a boot do you recommend? Because they have a lot uh, of boots out there. I think I have eight to 10 and my wife has a couple as well. Uh, but these granites have been a constant companion. These are the same ones that I got all those years ago. Absolutely love these boots. And then these guys right here, these, I think these are called the Hunter twos and love these insulated and, uh, snow muck slush. Just absolutely love these boots. These are some of my favorites right here. Uh, these get daily wear. I think these are called the Montanas, but uh, I just got a new pair uh, that just came in the other day. But these guys I've been wearing for, I think, two or three years now. And this is daily wear. You can tell there's a bunch of dirt on there that's dried now that it's uh, it's springtime here. But uh, I wear these pretty much all winter. Love these boots right here. And then these guys, these are the Hunter pull-ons. And since we moved to the new house, um, then these guys have been, uh, I've worn these every day throughout the winter because the snow is a little, um, a little deeper out here where we are right now. So I wore these pretty much every day throughout the winter. Absolutely love these things. So, uh, Schnees, thank you so much for, uh, man, all these years of amazing boots and check them out online, uh, Schnees and they have a bunch of other great stuff on there. Visit them in Bozeman, give them a call, talk to them about your needs for your particular hunt and they'll point you in the right direction. Awesome. And then, uh, I'm going to read this so I don't mess it up right here. Uh, so when you, sh when you shop there at Schnees.com and you spell that S C H N E E S Dot com. Make sure you use the promo code Jack21, J A C K 21. And then you'll save 10% off a pair of Schnee's boots and logo wear. So definitely do that. Jack21. And these handmade boots, they do sell out very quickly. So grab yours today. Take care of your feet. Don't compromise. Upgrade to Schnee's. And once again, that is S C H N E E S dot com and promo code. Jack 21. Because I just talked to Craig Whitlock about the Afghanistan Papers, a book that I think every American needs to read as soon as possible and gift to junior high school students, to high school students, to college students, um, would be a much better informed citizenry if we all read this book. Um, because we just talked about that, we talked about accountability of senior level military officials, just like junior level officers and junior level enlisted are held accountable for their actions on the battlefield, their decisions on the battlefield, whereas senior level military officers have not really been held accountable um, since Truman fired MacArthur during the Korean War. We've had generals, flag officers fired for different scandals, here and there, but the one general officer who was essentially fired during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan was fired for telling the truth, for telling the American public that his troops, that the war was not going as well as his predecessors had led them to believe. Uh, so in talking about accountability, uh, this right here is a book that was a gift from Mark Roberts. And it's The Life of General U.S. Ulysses S. Grant by J.S.C. Abbott. And this is an edition from 1868. Um, Mark Roberts, thank you so much. Uh, you can follow him at uh, Salmonier Shooter on Instagram. And you can go to wineserviceconsulting.com to, to check out what he has going on. So, Mark, thank you so much for this book. Um, I've tentatively opened it and looked through it, but it's 
it's so old and so incredible. Uh, I don't want to damage it, but oh my gosh, thank you. This means so much to me. Uh, sincerely appreciate it. And uh, yeah, 1868. Oh, the reason that was important is because President Lincoln went through general after general after general and held them accountable until he got to Grant. Uh, that is something we have not seen in the 21st century and latter half of the 20th century. Um, but President Lincoln did. That got us to Grant. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for sending this. Sincerely appreciate it. It means so, so much. Uh, what else do we have going on? Some gear. All right. So, Petzl headlamps. I've been a fan for the longest time. Uh, when I found out that they were not going to make uh, the Tika anymore in its same incarnation a few years back. And uh, I think the first ones came out, I might be wrong here, but I think uh, 1998, 97, 98, 99, somewhere in there where we got these great little headlamps. Uh, they got developed a little bit over time where you got to have, you get take a different angle on them right here. This one has a red physical pop up. You just put that up there. Um, I use these in Iraq, use these in Afghanistan. Um, and yeah, I have them in my backpack. I have them scattered about, but I love them because they are so simple. There is no programming involved. You hit the button, they come on. If you want the red light, you flip it up physically. Um, love these. But when I found out that they were not going to make them anymore, uh, I bought up about 50. So I still, <laughs> I still have quite a few, um, but, uh, but my supplies are dwindling. And I saw that they had a new edition out. They've had a couple different incarnations over the years, but I just tried this one out on a recent two week trip into uh, the Alaska backcountry. So this one right here, uh, Tika as well, and still articulates right there, but it's a little different. Going to take a little bit of getting used to because old school one, when you hit it, bam, it was the brightest one first. And then you could go one, two, three to go to a less bright version and then turn it off. This one's the opposite. So you click it and it's the lowest power first, then more power, then more power. So if you want full power off the bat, it's one, two, three. And it's possible there's a way to program this so it can switch that around, but it, uh, I don't know how to use that part yet. But uh, I really like this, obviously brighter than uh, than the original versions. Uh, just take a little bit of getting used to on my part. So Petzl, awesome. Uh, love what you guys do. And once again, I have these scattered about in our cars, in drawers, in my backpack, uh, all over the place. So you can't have enough headlamps. So awesome. Petzl headlamps. Amazing. And then this right here. So, uh, 10,000, I think it's 10,000.cc on Instagram and, uh, and website, but they're making some incredible athletic gear. I've been using the tactical short. Um, this is a new one right here that I'm going to use shortly. I should probably do it as soon as I record this actually. Um, but this is called the interval short. And this is, these are some well thought out shorts right here. And I've used a lot of athletic shorts over the years. Uh, 10,000 has reached out to different special operators and had them test these shorts over time and, uh, and evolved and adapt and created an amazing line of athletic apparel, the shorts right here. And then I just got this shirt here too. This is the lightweight tee that just came in the mail. So, uh, I'll be using these shortly because it's time to get back in shape. So that's it for this, uh, edition of the gear portion of the Danger Close podcast. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Six Hour. Follow Craig Whitlock at Craig M. Whitlock on Twitter. Pick up the Afghanistan papers, gift the Afghanistan papers. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Go to officialjackcar.com to check out my reading lists to uh, link to the book from there. You can go to a Jack Carr USA for the merch and be sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and or the Jack Carr YouTube channel. And please leave a five-star rating and review if you enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much for tuning in. In the Blood is also available for pre-order now wherever books are sold. And that is coming in 2022. Once again, the Afghanistan Papers, Craig Whitlock, read this book. Take care out there. Stay safe. Keep fighting.